What do you see? Uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, stand closer. You, you got to get close. Let it, let it pulsate. Let it, let it work on you. Uh, closer, closer, closer. No, no, too close. Too back, back. There. Now let it spread out. Let it wrap its arms around you. Let it embrace you, filling even your peripheral vision so that nothing else exists or has ever existed or will ever exist. Let the picture do its work, but work with it. Meet it halfway, for God's sake. Lean forward, lean into it, engage with it. <laughs> now, what do you see? Oh, oh, wait, wait. So now, what do you see? Be specific. No, be exact. Be exact, but sensitive. You understand? Be kind. Be a, a, be a human being. And that's all I can say. Be a human being for once in your life. These pictures deserve compassion, and they live or die in the eye of the sensitive viewer. They, they quicken only if the empathetic viewer will let them. That is what they cry out for. That is why they were created. That is what they deserve. Now, what do you see? Red. But do you like it? Speak up! Uh, yes. Okay. Of course you like it. How did you not like it? Everyone likes everything nowadays. They, they, they like the television and the photograph and the, the soda pop and the cracker jack and, and, and the, 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 everything becomes everything else and it's all nice and pretty and likable. Everything is fun in the sun. Where's the discernment? Hmm? Where's the arbitration that separates what I like? from what I respect, what I deem worthy, what has, listen to me now, significance. Oh, maybe this is a dinosaur talking. Maybe I'm a dinosaur sucking up the oxygen from all you cunning little mammals hiding in the bushes waiting to take over. Maybe I'm speaking a lost language unknown to your generation, but a generation that does not aspire to seriousness, to meaning, it's unworthy to walk in the shadow of those who have gone before. I mean those who have struggled and surmounted. I mean those who have a spider. I mean Rembrandt. I mean Turner. I mean, I mean uh, Michelangelo and Matisse. I mean obviously Rothko. <laughs> do you aspire? Yes. To what? To what do you aspire? I, I want to be a painter, so I guess I aspire to painting. Uh. Then those clothes won't do. We work here. <laughs> Hang up your jacket outside. I, uh, I appreciate you put on your Sunday clothes to impress me. It, 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 it's poignant, really. It, it touches me, but it's ridiculous. We work hard here. This isn't a goddamn old world salon with tea cakes and lemonade. Go hang up your jacket outside. Sydney told you what I need here. Yes. We start every morning at 9 and work until 5, just like bankers. You'll let me stretch the canvases and clean the paints and uh, clean the brushes and... Uh, build the stretchers and move the paintings and also help apply the ground color, which is not painting. So any lunatic assumption you make in that direction, you need to banish immediately. You'll uh, pick up cigarettes and, uh, and uh, food and anything else that I want, any whim, no matter how demanding or demeaning. If you don't like that, leave right now. Answer me, yes or no? Yes. Consider, I am not your rabbi, I am not your father, I am not your shrink, I am not your friend, I am not your teacher, I am your employer. Do you understand? Yes. As my assistant, you'll see many things here, many ingenious things, but they're all secret. You cannot talk about any of this. Don't think I don't have enemies, because I do. And I don't just mean the other painters and gallery owners and museum curators and goddamn son of a bitch art critics. Not to mention the vast panoply of disgruntled viewers who loathe me and my work because they do not have the heart, nor the patience, nor the capacity to think, to understand, because they are not human beings like we talked about. Do you remember? Yes. I'm painting a series of murals now. I'll probably do 30 or 40 and then choose which were best in concert, like a, like a fugue. You'll help me put on the undercoat and then I'll paint them and then I'll look at them and then I'll paint some more. I do a lot of layers, one after another like a glaze, slowly building the image, like pentimento, letting the luminescence emerge until it's done. How do you know when it's done? 
there's tragedy in every brush stroke. Oh. <laughs> well, let's have a drink. Answer me a question. Don't think about it. Just say the first thing that comes in your head. No cognition. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Who's your favorite painter? Oh, Jackson Pollock. <laughs> Sorry? No, no. Uh, let me try again. No. Come on. No, it's silly. Come on, ask me again. Who's your favorite painter? Picasso. <laughs> oh. Always talk. Um, don't get me wrong. He was he was a great painter. We came up together. I knew him very well. What was he like? You read Nietzsche. What? You ever read Nietzsche? The Birth of Tragedy. No. <laughs> you call yourself an artist? One can't discuss Pollock without it. One can't discuss anything without. What do they teach you in art school now? Uh, you read Freud? No. Young. Well, Byron, Wordsworth, Aeschylus, Gator, Sophocles, Schopenhauer, Shakespeare, Hamlet, at least Hamlet, please, God, quote me Hamlet, right now. Uh, to be or not to be, that is the question. Is that the question? I don't know. <laughs> you have a lot to learn, young man. Philosophy, theology, literature, poetry, drama, history, archaeology, anthropology, mythology, music. These are your tools. As much as brush and pigment, you cannot be an artist until you are civilized. You cannot be civilized until you learn. To be civilized is to know where you belong in the continuum of your art and your world. To surmount the past, you must know the past. I thought you weren't my teacher. You should be so blessed. I talk to you about art. <laughs> How do you feel? How do I feel? How do they make you feel? Oh, uh, give me a second. So, disquieted. And? Thoughtful. And? Sad. Tragic. Yeah. They're for a restaurant. What? They're for a restaurant. So, I'm minding my own business when Mr. Philip Johnson calls me. You know, Mr. Mr. Philip Johnson, a world-renowned architect. Well, not personally. Of course you don't know him personally. You don't know anyone personally. Don't interrupt! Mr. Philip Johnson calls me. He's designing a secret building on Park Avenue. He and Miss Fonderow. Well, these are names with which to conjure, are they not? Philip Johnson and Miss Fonderow, titans in their field, revolutionists. Together they are making a building unlike anything the world has yet seen, reflecting the golden ambitions of not only this city and its inhabitants, but of all mankind. And in this building is to be a restaurant called the Four Seasons, like the Vivaldi, and on the walls of this restaurant. <laughs> 35 thousand dollars they are paying me. No other painter comes close. My first mirrors. Imagine a frieze all around the room, a continuous narrative filling the walls, one to another, each a new chapter, the story unfolding. Look! And they are there, inescapable and inexorable. I do. Are these ones done? They're in process. I have to study them now. Study them? Yeah, most, most of painting is thinking. Oh, my God. 
Didn't they teach you that? 10% is putting paint onto the canvas. The rest is weight. Hmm. All my life, I've wanted just this, my friend. To create a place. A place where the viewer can live in contemplation with the work and give it some of the same attention and care I give it. Like a chapel, a place of communion. But it's a restaurant. No. I will make it a temple. Cessation. There's another Chinese round the corner. Ah, the eternal cycles grind on. Generations pass away. Hope turns empty. But there's another Chinese round the corner. Not much for small talk. It's small. So I went to the modern last night and saw the Picasso show. And? I don't think he's so concerned with generations passing away. Mm, don't kid yourself, kid. That man, though, uh, narrow charlatan, of course, citing menus for money like Dolly, when he's not making ugly little pots also for money, that man at his best understood the workings of time. Where's the receipt? Mm. Tragic, really, to grow superfluous in your own lifetime. We destroyed cubism, de Kooning and me, and Pollock and Barnett Newman and all the others. We, we stomped it to death. No one can paint a cubist picture today. You take pride in that, stomping cubism to death. Child must banish the father, respect him, but kill him. And enjoy it? It doesn't matter, just be audacious and do it. Courage in painting isn't facing the blank canvas, it's facing Mene, it's facing Velazquez. All, all we can do is move beyond what was there to what is here, and hope to get some intimation of what will be here, what is past and passing to come. That's Yates, whom you haven't read. Come on, but Picasso... Picasso, I think, for teaching me that movement is everything. Movement is life. The second we're born, we squall, we writhe, we, we squirm. To live is to move. Without... Movement. Paintings are what? Dead. Precisely. Look at the tension between the blocks of color, the dark and the light, the red and the black and the brown. They exist in a state of flux, of movement. They butt each other on the actual canvas, so too do they butt each other in your eye. They ebb and flow and shift, gently pulsating. The more you look at them, the more they move, they, they float in space, they breathe. Movement, communication, gesture, flux, interaction, letting them work. They're not dead because they're not static. They move through space if you let them. And this movement takes time, so the temporal, they require time. They demand it. They don't work without it. This is why it's so important to me to create a place, a place where the viewer can contemplate the paintings over time and let them move. They need the viewer. They're not like representational pictures, like traditional landscapes or portraits. Tell me why. Uh, because they, they move, they change, they pulse. Representational pictures are unchanging. They don't require the active participation of the viewer. In a Louvre in the middle of the night, 
The Mona Lisa is still smiling. But do these paintings still pulse when they're alone? That's why you keep the lights so low. Is it? To, to help the illusion, uh, like a magician. Like a play. To keep it mysterious, to let the pictures pulsate. Uh, turn on bright lights and the stage effect is ruined. Suddenly it's nothing but a bare stage with a bunch of fake walls. What do you see? Yeah, my eyes are adjusting. Just white. Hmm. What does white make you think of? Bones, skeletons, charnel house, anemia, cruelty. Really? It's like an operating theater now. How does uh, white make you feel? Frightened. Why? Doesn't matter. Why? It's like the snow outside the window where my parents died. It, it was winter. I remember the snow outside the window. White. Ah, and, and, and the pictures in this light, they're flat, vulgar. This light hurts them. You see how it is with them? How, how vulnerable they are? People think I'm controlling, controlling the light, controlling the height of the paintings, controlling the, the shape of the gallery. It's not controlling, it's protecting. A picture lives by companionship. It dies by the same token. It's a risky act to send it out into the world. You ever paint outdoors? You mean out in nature? Yeah. Nature doesn't work for me. The light's no good. All those bumps. Ah. Oh, I know those plein air painters, they sing to you endless pins about the majesty of natural sunlight. Get out there and muck around in the grass, they tell you, like, like a cow. When I was young, I didn't know any better. I would haul my supplies out there, the wind would blow the paper, the, the easel would fall over, the, the ants would get into the paint. Oy. But then i go to Rome. For the first time, i go to the Santa Maria de Popolo to see Carvaggio's conversion of St. Paul, which turns out is tucked away in a dark corner of this dark church with no natural light, like a cave. But the painting glowed with, a, with a, a sort of rapture. It glowed. Now consider, Carvaggio was commissioned to paint the picture for this specific place. He had no choice. He stands there and he looks around. It's like under the ocean. It's the goddamn dark. How's he going to pay here? He turns to his creator. God, help me, unworthy sinner that I am. Tell me, oh Lord on high, what the fuck do I do now? <laughs> then it comes to him. The divine spark he illuminates the painting from within. He gives it inner luminosity. It lives like like one of those uh, bioluminescent fish from the bottom of the ocean, radiating its own effulgence, you understand? Carvajal was... Bring me the second bucket. Wait, are you really gonna paint? What the hell do you think I have been doing? Now give me black number four and the first one. Pinch it black. Like just that amount again. Like twice as much more.
fuck are you? What, what have you done? What have you seen? Where have you earned the right to exist here with me and these things? You don't understand! Red? You want to paint the thing? Go ahead! Here's, here's red, and red, and red! I don't even know what that means. What, 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 what does red mean to me? Do you mean scarlet? You mean crimson? You mean plum, mulberry, magenta, burgundy, salmon, carmine, cornelian, coral? Anything but red? What is red? I meant sunrise. Sunrise? I meant the red and sunrise. The feeling of it. Oh, oh, the feeling of it. What do you mean, the feeling of it? Well, I didn't mean red paint only. I meant the emotion of red at sunrise. Sunrise isn't red. Yes, it is. I'm telling you, it's not. Sunrise is red, and red is sunrise. Red is heartbeat. Red is passion. Red wine. Red roses. Red lipstick. That beats. Tulips. Peppers. I carry your blood. That too? Rust. On the bike. On the lawn. And apples. And tomatoes. This, uh... Dressed in firestorm at night. The, the sun and Rousseau. The flag and Delacroix. The robe and Albrico. A rabbit's nose. An albino's eyes, a parakeet, Florentine marble, atomic flash, nick yourself shaving, blood in the barbasol, uh, the ruby slippers, uh, technicolor, the phone to the Kremlin on the president's desk, Russian flag, Nazi flag, Chinese flag, persimmons, pomegranates, red light district, red tape, rouge, lava, lobsters, scorpions, stop sign, sports car, a blush, viscera, flame, dead fulvus, sapphic lights, tissue and hair, slash your wrist, blood in the sink, Santa Claus, Satan! So, red. Exactly. We got more cigarettes? More than anything. You know what? What? Matisse is painting the red studio. It's a picture of his own studio. The walls are a brilliant red. The floor and furniture all red. As if the color had radiated out of him and swallowed everything up. When the modern first put that painting up, I would spend hours looking at it, day after day I would go. It could be argued that everything I do today, the bloodlines can be traced back to that painting and those hours standing there, letting it work, allowing the painting to, to, to move. The more I looked at it, the more it pulsated around me. I was totally saturated. It swallowed me. Such planes of red such energetic blocks of color, such emotion. That was a long time ago. It's still there. I can't look at it now. Why? Too depressing. How can all that red be depressing? I don't see the red anymore. 
even in that painting, that total profound immersion in red, it's there. Mantle, above a dresser, just over the center line, set off by yellow of all goddamn things. He, he wanted it inescapable. What? Black. The color black? The thing black. There's only one thing I fear in life, my friend. One day, the black will swallow the red. For you to say you don't know him. No, I'll show it to him if I think the moment's right. And he knows I'm a painter, he's gotta be expecting it, right? No, 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 it depends on his mood. But no, don't say that. You're just like him. Ah, he's here. I'll tell you how it goes. Pray for me. Good morning. Good morning. Oh I've uh, I've got the other maroon. I'll, I'll finish up. You, you finish the candle. Well, I, uh, I went by the Seagram building last night. It's coming along. How's the restaurant? It's still under construction, but uh, they uh, took me around. They got a sense of it. And? Too much natural light, as always, but it, it'll work. You'll be able to see the murals in the main dining room. I made some sketches. I'll, I'll find them for you. Uh, you ever worry it's not the right place for him? How can it not be the right place for him when they're being created specifically for that place? Sometimes your logic baffles me. So, uh, I read Nietzsche, Birth the Tragedy, like you said. Like I said? Hey, he said if I wanted to know about Jackson Pollock, I had to read The Birth of Tragedy. Is it then? Yeah. I don't remember. Well, that's very much like something I would say. So what about Pollock? First tell me what do you make of the book. Yeah, interesting. It's like saying red. Don't be enigmatic. You're too young to be enigmatic. I think I know why you wanted me to read it. Why? Because you see yourself as Apollo and him as Dionysus. Don't be so pedestrian. Think more. Well, uh, Dionysus is the god of wine and excess, of movement and transformation. So this is Pollock, wild, rebellious, drunken, and unrestrained, the raw experience itself. Apollo is the god of order, method, and boundaries. This is Rothko, intellectual, rabbinical, sober, and restrained, the raw experience leavened by uh, contemplation. He splatters paint, you study it. He's Dionysus, and you're Apollo. Exactly right. But we're entirely missing the point. But how so? You missed the tragedy. The point is always the tragedy. Yeah, for you. You think human beings can be divided up so neatly into character types? You think the multifarious complexities and nuances of the psyche evolving through countless generations, perverted and demented through social neuroses and personal anguish, molded by faith and lack of faith, can really be so goddamn simple? Pollock is emotion and Rothko is intellect. You embarrass yourself. Think more! Maybe it's like one of your paintings. Most things are, Hal. 
dark and light, order and chaos, existing at the same time in the same plane, pulsing back and forth. We pulse too. We are subjects of both Apollo and Dionysus, not one or the other. We ebb and flow like the colors in your pictures. The ecstasy of the Dionysian at war with the restraint of the Apollonian. Not war. They're not at war. Not really conflict, more like symbiosis. They need each other. Mm. Dionysus' passion is, is focused, is made bearable by Apollo's will to form. In fact, the only way we can endure the sheer ferocity of Dionysus' emotion is because we have the control and intellect of Apollo. Otherwise, the emotion would overwhelm us. So back and forth we go, myth to myth, pulsating. And the perfect life would be perfectly balanced between the two, everlastingly on the fulcrum. But our tragedy is that we can never achieve that balance. We exist, all of us, for all time in a state of perpetual dissonance. We long for the raw truth of emotion. We can only endure it with the cool eye of reason. We seek to capture the ephemeral, the miraculous, and put it on the canvas, stopping time. Now, like the etymologist pinning the butterfly, it dies when we try. We're foolish that way, we human beings, we try to make the black red. But the black is always there, like the mantle in Matisse. Like the snow outside the window, it never goes away. Once glimpsed, we can't help being preoccupied with it, for the intimations of our mortality are... But still we go on, clinging to that, that, that tiny bit of hope, that red, that makes the rest... Endurable. Or just less unendurable. Yeah. That's my friend Jackson Pollock. Finally, it was just unendurable. What do you mean? It's suicide. He didn't commit suicide. Didn't he? Oh, Jackson Pollock died in a car accident. A man spends years getting drunk. Day after day, hammered. Then he gets into an Oldsmobile convertible and races around these little country roads like a lunatic. Now you tell me what that is, if not a lazy suicide. Believe me, when I commit suicide, there won't be any doubt about it. No mysterious crumpled car in a ditch, did he or didn't he? It gives me a headache, it's so boring. When you commit suicide? What? You said, when I commit suicide. No, I didn't. You did? No, you misheard. Let me tell you one thing about your hero. That man really confronted his tragedy. He was valiant in the face of it. He endured as long as he could. Then he tried to recede from life. But how could he? He was Jackson Pollock. What was his tragedy? He became famous. Don't be glib. His muse evacuated. He grew tired of his form. He grew tired of himself. He lost faith in his viewers. Take your pick. He no longer believed there were any real human beings out there to look at pictures. How does that happen to a man? Maybe you should ask how occasionally it doesn't happen. I mean, he's an artist. He's in Life magazine. He's young. He's famous. He has money. That's exactly it. Here's a schmuck from Wyoming who can paint. Suddenly, he's a commodity. He's Jackson Pollock. Let me tell you, kid. That Oldsmobile convertible really did kill him. Not because it crashed. Because it existed. Why the fuck did Jackson Pollock have an Oldsmobile <laughs> convertible? <laughs> so artists should starve. Yes, artists should starve. Except me. <laughs> Take a look. You would have loved Jackson Pollock. Oh, he was a downtown guy, a real bohemian. No backers hours for him, believe you me. Every night the 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 drinking and the, the talking and the, the fighting and the dancing and the staying up late like like everyone's romantic idea of what an artist ought to be, the anti Rothko. <laughs> and his worst, you still loved him though. He loved him because he loved art so much. He thought it mattered. He thought painting mattered. There's not the buoyancy, stop your heart. How could this story not end in tragedy? Goya said we have art that we may not perish from truth. Pollock saw some truth, and then he didn't have art to protect him anymore. Who could survive that?
Oh, uh, I was walking up to my house last week and this couple was passing. Lady looks in the window and says, I wonder who owns all the Rothkos? Just like that on the noun. A Rothko. A commodity. An overmantle. A what? The overmantles, those paintings destined to become decoration, you know, over the fireplace and the penthouse. They tell you, I need something to work with the sofa, you understand, or maybe something bright and cheery for the breakfast nook, which is orange. Do you have anything in orange, or burnt umber, or seafoam green? And, oh, here's a paint chip from the Sherwin Williams, and could you cut it down to fit the sideboard? <laughs> or, huh, even worse, darling, I simply must have one because my neighbor has one, that social planning bitch. In fact, if she has one, I need three. Or, <laughs> even worse, I must have one because the New York Times tells me I should have one. Or maybe someone told me the New York Times tells me I should have one because who has time to read anymore? Oh, don't make me look at it. I never look at it. It's so depressing. All those fuzzy rectangles. My kid could do that in kindergarten. It's nothing but a scam. This guy's a fraud. Huh. Still, they buy it. It's, it's an investment. It's screwing the neighbor. It's, it's buying class. It's, it's buying taste. Goes with the lamp. It's cheaper than a pollock. It's interior decoration. Anything but what it is. Okie dokie. Let's climb the campus. No, no, what is it? 
It's strange, I'm remembering something. The color is... Uh, what? Doesn't matter. What? Dried blood. When the blood dried, it got darker on the carpet. Which carpet? Where my parents sat. God, it's exactly the color. No, and when, when the blood dried, it, it got darker. That surprised me. I remember being surprised by that. What happened to your parents? No, I don't want to talk about it. Yes, you do. They were murdered. Did you say murdered? How old were you? Seven. This was back in Iowa. What happened? I honestly don't remember it too well. Sure you do. What do you see? What do you see? I woke up and the first thing I saw was the snow outside the window. I was glad it had snowed because it was Saturday. And I can go sledding. Yeah, my, my dad would take me sledding, me and my sister. But, uh, but I didn't smell anything. And that was strange. Normally, my mom would be up making breakfast. It was really quiet. I put on my slippers. They were those neolite ones that looked like moccasins. Go into the hall. Now it's really quiet. Cold. There's a window open somewhere. And then I see my sister standing in the middle of the hallway, staring into my parents' room. The door's open. My sister. Standing in a puddle of pee. Just staring. Her eyes. I go to the door and I look in. And I see the snow first. Outside the window, so much snow. Maybe I'll still go sledding. And then the blood. The bed is stained with it. And the wall. They are on the bed. It was a knife. Apparently it was the knife I found out later. Burglars I found out. At least two of them. Now I, I, I don't know what to do. I, I just see. 
I don't want my sister to see anymore. My little sister. So I turn around and push her out and shut the door. The door handle with blood was red. What happened then? I mean, after that, uh, nothing, really. We went to the neighbors. They called the police. What happened to you two? State took us. Foster homes. People were nice, actually. They kept us together. But they uh, shuffled us around a lot. We were rootless. She's married to a CPA now. Um, rootless. And never had a place, never belonged. Did they, uh, find the guys who did it? <clears throat> no. I, uh, I paint pictures of them sometimes. You paint pictures of the men who killed your parents? What I imagine them to look like. Which is what? Normal. Uh, <clears throat> when I um, when I was a kid in Russia, I saw the Cossacks cutting people up and tossing them in the pits. At least I think I remember that. Maybe someone told me about it, or I'm just being dramatic. <laughs> it's hard to say sometimes. How old were you when you came here? Ten. We went to Portland, lived in the ghetto alongside all the other thinky-talky Jews. I was Marcus Rothkowitz then. You changed your name. Hmm. My first dealer said he had too many Jewish painters on the books, so Marcus Rothkowitz becomes Mark Rothko. Now nobody knows I'm a Jew. Can I ask you something? Can I stop you? Are you really scared of black? No, I'm really scared of the absence of light. Like going blind? Like going dead. And you equate the color black with death. Doesn't everyone? I'm asking you. Yes. I equate the color black with the diminution of the light force. Black means decay and darkness? Doesn't it? Because black is the lack of red, if you will. Because black is the opposite of red. Not on the spectrum, but in reality. Yeah, but I'm talking about in painting. Then talk about painting. In your pictures, the bold colors are the Dionysian element, kept in check by the strict geometric shapes, the Apollonian element. The bright colors are your passion, your will to survive, your life force. Hmm. But if black swallows those colors, then you lose that excess and extravagance, and what do you have left? Go on. I'm fascinated by me. Lose those colors, and you have order with no content. You have mathematics with no numbers. 
nothing but empty air in boxes. And trust me, as you get older, those colors are harder to sustain. The palette fades, and we race to catch it before it's gone. But what? Never mind. What? You'll get mad. Me? You will. And? <laughs> I just think it's kind of sentimental to equate black with death. That seems an antiquated notion, sort of romantic. Romantic? I mean, not honest. Really? In reality, we both know black's a tool, just like ochre or magenta, it has no real effect. Seeing it as malevolent is a weird sort of... Chromatic anthropomorphizing. <laughs> you think so, huh? Uh, uh, what about equating white with death? Like, um, snow? Mm -mm, that's different. That's just a personal reaction. I'm not trying to build a whole artistic sensibility around this. Maybe you should. No, I don't Use think your own life, why not? No, not? Unless you're scared of it. No, I'm not scared. Go into all that white. I'm not scared. It's just self-indulgent. You say so. Not all art has to be psychodrama. Doesn't it? No. You paint pictures of the men who killed your parents. That's not all I paint. Maybe it should be. Then maybe you'd understand what black is. Back to that. Always. You know, at least equating white with death isn't so predictable. Oh, I'm predictable now. Kind of? Dishonest and predictable. Come on, a painter gets older and the color black starts to infuse his work. Therefore, the cliché declension goes, a, he's depressed, he's fearing death, he's losing touch, he's losing relevance, mm. he's saying goodbye. That's a cliché except for when it's not. But it's not true. Oh, so now you know true! Look at Van Gogh. His last paintings were all color. He goes out and paints the most ecstatic yellows and blues known to man, then shoots himself. Or Matisse. His last works were nothing but great sharks of primary colors. You admire those colors. Absolutely. Why? Well, Ma Matisse. He was dying. He knew he was dying, but still he was Matisse. When he got too ill to hold a paintbrush, he, would use, he used scissors, cutting up paper to make collages. He never gave up. But on his deathbed, he was still arranging the color patterns on the ceiling. He had to be who he was. And you think I'm the romantic? No, that's... Can't you do any better than that? Matisse, the dying hero, struggling with his last puny gaps to create that final masterpiece. And Jackson Pollock, the beautiful doomed youth, dying like Chatterton in his classic Pieta Pose. And Van Gogh, oh, uh oh, of course Van Gogh, trotted out on all occasions, the ubiquitous symbol for everything. Van Gogh, the misunderstood martyr. You insult these men by reducing them to your adolescent stereotypes. Grapple with them, yes, argue with them, always. But don't think you understand them. Don't think you have captured them. They are beyond you. Spend a lifetime with them, and you might, you might get a moment of insight into their pain. Until then, allow them their grandeur in silence. Silence is so accurate. Mind if I go out? Go on. Wait. In the National Gallery in London, there's a painting by Rembrandt called Belshazzar's Feast. It's an Old Testament story from Daniel. Belshazzar, king of Babylon, is giving a feast, and he blasphemes. So a divine hand appears and writes some Hebrew words on the walls, a warning in the painting. These pictures pulsate from the dark canvas like something miraculous. Rembrandt's Hebrew was atrocious, as you can imagine, but he wrote, Mene, Mene, Teka, Ufarsin. You have been weighed in the balance and have been found wanting. That's what black is to me. What is it to you?
Kill me, I swear to God! They're trying to kill me! Those prosaic insects, those, 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 those presumptuous, counter-jumping, you're a beast! Sons of bitches! These are the same goddamn walls for I hang! You appreciate that? My gallery! My walls! Polluted now beyond hygiene, beyond sanitation, like the East River, choked with garbage! All the, the all that superficial, meaningless sewage right up there in the wall! The same sacred space of de Kooning and Motherwell and Smith and Newman and Pollock and, and... What is this music? Chet Baker. Oh, God, just when I thought the day couldn't get worse. It's Chet. When you pay the rent, you can take the records. Go. How'd you like the exhibit? <laughs> These young artists are out to murder me. That's kind of extreme. But not inaccurate. You think Jasper Johns is trying to murder you? Yes. Oh, what about Frank Stella? Yes. Robert Rauschenberg? Yes. Roy Lichtenstein? Which one is he? Comic books. Oh. Yes! <laughs> Andy Warhol? You sound like an old man. I am an old man. Not that old. But today, I'm old. If you say so. My, my point is, people like me, my contemporary, my, my, my colleague, those painters who came up with me, we all had one thing in common. We understood the importance of seriousness. You're too much. What? You heard me? What did you say to me? Who are you to assume they're not serious? Look at their work! I have. Not like you usually look at things like an overeager undergraduate. I have. Then what do you see? Never mind. No! No! You look at them, what do you see? At this moment, right now. In all those flags and comic books and oh, soap cans! This moment, right now, and a little bit tomorrow. And you think that's good? It's neither good nor bad, but it's what people want. Aha! Exactly my point. But so art shouldn't be popular at all now? It shouldn't only be popular. You may not like it, but nowadays, as many people are genuinely moved by Frank Stella as by Mark Rothko. Oh, that's nonsense. You don't think so? You know, you know the problem with those painters? It's exactly what you said. They paint for this moment, right now, and that's all! It's nothing but zeitgeist art, completely simple, completely disposable, like Kleenex. Like like, like, like like comic books. Do you really think Andy Warhol will be hanging in museums a hundred years from now alongside the Brugge and the Ramirez. He's hanging alongside Rothko now. Because those goddamn cowies will do anything for money, cater any wicked take. That's business, young man, not art. You ever get tired of telling people what art is? No, not ever. Until they listen. Better you should tell me. <laughs> Fuck off. You're just mad because the barbarians are at the gate. And what do you know? People seem to like the barbarians. Of course they like them. It's a goddamn point. You, 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 you know what people like? Happy, bright colors. They want things to be pretty. They want things to be beautiful. Jesus Christ! When somebody tells me one of my pictures is beautiful, I want to vomit. What's wrong? Pretty, beautiful, nice, fine. That's our life now. Everything's fine. We put on the funny nose and the glasses and we slip them on banana peel and TV makes everything happy and everyone's laughing all the time. It's all so goddamn funny. It's our, it's our constitutional right to be amused all the time. It's, Oh, we were smirking at you, living under the tyranny of fine. How are you? Fine. How's your day? Fine. How are you feeling? Fine. How'd you like the painting? Fine. Want some dinner? Fine. Well, let me tell you, everything is not fine. How are you? How was your day? How are you feeling? Conflicted, nuanced, troubled, diseased, doomed. 
I am not fine. We are not fine. We're anything but fine. Look at these pictures. Look at them. You see a dark rectangle like a doorway and an aperture. Yes, but it's also a gaping mouth letting out a silent howl, something feral and fell and primal and real. Not nice, not fine. Real. A moon. A rapture, something divine or damned, something immortal, not coming from the soup can, something beyond me and beyond now, and whatever it is, it's not pretty and it's not fine. I am here to stop your heart. You understand that? I am here to make you think. I am not here to make pretty pictures. So said the cubist, the second before you stopped him to death. Tragic, really, to grow superfluous in your own lifetime. Right? The child must banish the father. Respect him, but kill him. Isn't that what you said? You guys went after the cubists and surrealists, and boy, did you love it. And now your time is coming. You don't want to go. Well, exit stage left, Rothko, because pop art has banished abstract expressionism. I'm going to pray to God they have more generosity of spirit than you do, and allow you some dignity as you go. Consider. The last gasp of a dying race. Futility. Don't worry. You can always sign menus for money. How dare you! Do you know where I live? What? Do you know where I live? In the city? No. Uptown? Downtown? <laughs> Brooklyn? No. You know if I'm married? What? You know if I'm married? Dating? Queer? Anything? No! Why should Two I- Two years I've been working here. Eight hours a day. Five days a week, and you know nothing about me. Have you ever once asked me to dinner? Maybe you'd come to your house? What is the no, you know I'm a painter, don't you? I suppose. No, answer me. You know I'm a painter? Yes! Have you ever once asked to look at my work? Why should I? Why should I? You're an employee. This is about me. Everything here is about me. You don't like that? Leave. Oh, is that what this is all about? Baby feels wounded, dad didn't pat him on the head, mommy didn't hug you today? Stop. Don't blame me. I didn't kill him. Stop. Go find a psychiatrist and quit whining to me about it. Your neediness bored me. Bores you? Bores you? Christ almighty, try working for you for a living. The talking, talking, talking. Jesus Christ, won't he ever shut up. Titanic self-absorption of the man. You stand there trying to look so deep when you're nothing but a solipsistic bully with your grandiose self-importance and lectures and arias and... Let's look at the fucking canvas for another few weeks. Let's not fucking paint. Let's just look. Oh, and the pretension. Jesus Christ, the pretension. I can't imagine any other painter in the history of art ever tried so hard to be significant. You know, not everything has to be so goddamn important all the time. Not all paintings have to rip your guts out and expose your soul. Not everyone wants art that actually hurts. Sometimes you, you just want a fucking still life, or a landscape, or a soup can, or a comic book. 
which you might learn if you ever actually left your goddamn hermetically sealed submarine here with all the windows closed and no natural light because natural light isn't good enough for you. But then again, nothing is good enough for you. Not even the people who buy your paintings. <laughs> Museums are mausoleums. Galleries are run by pimps and swindlers. And art collectors are nothing but shallow social climbers. So who is good enough to own your art? Anyone? Or, or maybe the real question is, who's good enough to even see your art? Is it just possible that no one is worthy of looking at your painting? That's it, isn't it? We've all been weighed in the balance and have been found mm -hmm. wanting. You say you spend your life in search of real human beings. People who can view your art with compassion. But in your heart, you no longer believe those people exist. So you lose faith. So you lose hope. So black swallows red. <laughs> My friend, I don't think you recognize a real human being if you were standing right in front of me. Never mind. Don't give up so easy. This isn't a game. You do make one salient point, though. Not the one you think. Naturally. I do get depressed when I think about how people are going to see my pictures, if they're going to be unkind. Selling a painting is like sending a blind child into a room full of razor blades. It's going to get hurt and has never been hurt before. Doesn't know what hurt is. That's why I'm looking to do something different with these ones. They're less vulnerable somehow, more robust. To muse from the earth even, to give them strength. And they're not alone, they're serious. They always have each other for companionship and protection. And most important, they're going into a place created just for them, a place of reflection. A place of contemplation. Yes. A place with no distraction. Yes. <laughs> a sacred space. Yes. A chapel. Yes. Like the Four Seasons Restaurant. At least Andy Warhol gets the joke. No, no. You don't understand. It's a fancy what? dining room in a big high rise owned by a rich corporation. What don't I understand? You don't understand my intention. Your intention is immaterial. Unless you're gonna stand there next to the paintings giving lectures for the rest of your life, which you'd probably enjoy, the art has to speak for itself, yes? Yes, but Just I... admit your hypocrisy. The high priest of modern art is painting a wall in the temple of consumption. You rail against commercialism and art, but pal, you're taking the money. I, now, I yeah, sure, you can try and kid yourself you're creating a holy place of contemplative awe. 
But in reality, you're just paying another dining room for the super rich. And these things are nothing but the world's most expensive overmantles. Why do you think I took this commission? It appealed to your vanity. How so? They could have gone to de Kooning, they went to you. It's the flashiest mural commission since the Sistine Chapel. Mm. You would have turned them down. In a second. <laughs> Easy for you to say. You know what this is? It's your Oldsmobile convertible. <laughs> Come on, you don't need the money. You don't need the publicity. Why make yourself a hypocrite for the Seagram Corporation? I didn't enter into this capriciously, you know. I thought about it. And of course it appealed to my vanity. I, I, I'm a human being, too. But still, I hesitated. The very same thoughts. Is it corrupt? Is it immoral? Defeating the whims of the bourgeoisie? Should I do it? I'm still thinking about what the murals might look like when I take a trip to Europe. I, I happen to go to Michelangelo's Medici Library in Florence. You, you've been there? No. Well, you do. Be sure to find the staircase. It's, it's hidden away. It's a tiny vestibule. It's, it's like a vault. It's so cramped. But it goes up for three stories. Now, Michelangelo embraced this claustrophobia and created false doors and windows all the way up the walls. Rectangles in rich reds and browns. Well, that was it. He achieved just the kind of feeling I was after for the Four Seasons. No, he makes, the, he makes the viewer feel like he's trapped in a room where all the doors and windows are bricked up. So all he can do is butt his head against the wall forever. I know that place where all the richest bastards in the yard were going to feed and show up, and I hope to ruin the appetite of every son of a bitch who eats there. Mention this to the Seagram people? <laughs> it would be a compliment if they turn the mirrors down. They won't. You want a drink? Sure. I don't know. What? I don't know that I believe you. About what? Them. This malicious intent of yours. The old lion still roaring, still trying to provoke, to be relevant. Stick it to the bourgeoisie. It doesn't make sense. Too romantic for you? Too cruel to them. Your paintings aren't weapons. You wouldn't do that to them. And maybe you started the commission thinking that way, but... Then art happened. Couldn't help it, it's what you do. So now you're stuck. You've painted yourself into a corner. You should forgive the expression. No, no, you're wrong. Their power will transcend the setting. Working together, moving in rhythm, whispering to one another, they will still create a place. <laughs> you think I'm just kidding myself. You think it's all an anti monumental self delusion? Answer me. Answer me. Yes. Oh. I'm fired, aren't I? Fired? This is the first time you've existed. See you tomorrow.
the music? Christ. I was going to paint. Yeah, no kidding. A towel, maybe a paintbrush. I went there. What? Four seasons. After our little chat yesterday, I went there for dinner. Ah. It's been open a couple of weeks. Thought I should uh, finally go and take, take a look. And? You go in from 52nd, then up some stairs to the restaurant. You hear the room before you see it. Glasses clinking, silverware voices. It's hard to hear, but, but the building as you get closer, it's a desperate sound like forced gaiety at gunpoint. You go in, feel underdressed, feel fat, feel too bad I'm Jewish for this place. Give your name, pretty hostess gives you a look that says, I know who you are and I'm not impressed. We got millionaires in here, pal. She snaps for the maitre d', who snaps for the captain, who snaps for the head waiter, who brings you to the crowd, to your table, heads turning, everyone looking at everyone else all the time like predators. Who are you? What are you worth? Do I need to fear you? Do I need to acquire you? Wine guy comes, speaks French. You feel inadequate. You obviously don't understand. He doesn't care. You embarrass yourself ordering something expensive. You impress the one guy. He goes, unimpressed. And then, <laughs> can't help it, you start hearing what people are saying around you, which is worst of all. Oh. Chatter of monkeys and the barking of jackals. It's not human. And everyone's clever, and everyone's laughing, and no one looks at anything, and no one thinks about anything. And all they do is chatter and bark and eat, and the knives and forks click and clack, and the voices cut, and the teeth snap and snarl, and in that place, there, will live my paintings. For all time. I wonder. You think they'll ever forget? They're only paintings. Mr. Charles Johnson, please. This is Mark Rothko on the line. Hello, this is Rothko. Listen, I went to the restaurant last night. Let me tell you, anybody who eats that kind of food for that kind of money and that kind of joint will never look at a painting of mine. I'm, I'm, I'm sending back the money and I'm keeping the murals. No, no offense. This, this is how it goes. Go luck to you, buddy.
Now, now you are Mark Rothko. I'm a poor. Having money doesn't make you wealthy. Doesn't matter. It does. Write down your address. I'll send your final check. No, you owe me an explanation. I don't owe you anything. Uh, uh, two years I've been here, and you want me to walk out just like that? You want a retirement party? I want a reason. None of your business. I want a reason. God. Look. <laughs> You're too goddamn needy, all right? I don't need it. I don't need your need. Since you are seven, you're looking for a home. Well, this isn't it, and I'm not your father. Your father's dead, remember? Sorry, but that's it. Oh, come on, Dr. Freud, you can do better. Why? I told you. <laughs> Why? Because I don't need an assistant. Bullshit. Because you talk too much. So do you. Because you have lousy taste. Bullshit. Because I'm sick of you. Bullshit. Because your life is out there! Look, kid, you, you don't need to spend any more time with me. You need to find your contemporaries. Make your own world, your own life. Get out there now. Get into the thick of it. Shake your fist at them, talk your ear off, make them look. When I was your age, art was a lonely thing. No galleries, no collecting, no critics, no money. We didn't have mentors, we didn't have parents. We were alone. It was a great time because we had nothing to lose and a vision to gain. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Make something new. What do you see? Red. Thank you. 
Thank <laughs> you.